What's that? So I'm sure the NSA was recording the entire thing. They didn't wait until they think that it's recording. What's up? Okay, then it'll get in. Uh, University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign. We need to get a little intro uh, for our YouTube video. Yeah, a little jingle. jingle. Huh? Yeah, a little jingle would be kind of cool. All right, let's go ahead and knock our, uh, get through the meeting notes here. And sorry, it will be a project meeting, just so everybody knows. Um, Richard Solomon will be speaking on campus uh, next week. The details are at the Free Software Foundation link. You can check that out. Uh, Wayland, did you want to say anything that's not already in the notes? Uh, no, I hope you can make it. Um, yeah, I just hope you can make it. Uh, it's free. It's not really going to be a technical talk. It's going to be about the open source software movement. Uh, I think we said the title of the talk is Free Software and Your Freedom. Um, so we'll talk about the history of the new operating system, um, as well as some of the issues and concerns surrounding um, the open source software movement. Uh, so yeah, it starts at 5.30, and it's free, it's open to the public, tell your friends. Um, so long as you're seating, you can show up or stand or sit or whatever. Um, we will be videotaping it, so hopefully we'll be able to distribute copies or something after oh, the fact. Cool. Uh, Sites is actually going to report for us. Um, They're going to bring in recording equipment? Yeah, they, they do this apparently as a service, and it's like $75 an hour. Um, so they're going to come in and professionally report. I don't know how professional it is, but somebody will report it who presumably won't fuck it up. Um, so yeah, pretty excited. Do you have an idea of how many people are going to be there? No clue. Uh, so it is on the FSF website, and I've gotten emails from people at Eastern Illinois about it. <laughs> um, I did put out an e-week notification for faculty and staff, so like presumably a lot of people on campus know about it. I don't know. We're hoping for 400 people. I don't know if we'll fill that many, um, but it'd be really cool if we did. Um, so yeah, hopefully we'll get some flyers up soon. There was a little bit of a hiccup with that. So, so yeah, are we your friends? Need, uh, do, we, do we need to be in the space prior to that? Um, About so I'm going. To, I would like to arrange a, a photo opportunity with the core members. So pretty much everybody in this room. Uh, I'd probably get a hold of Brian to that if possible, um, just so we could get a quarter picture. And that's going to be before. And Devin. Uh, I I don't know specifically yet. I would hypothesize that yes, it will be um, before or after. Okay. I don't know. I I'd like to get a picture with the yeah. core members. Yeah. I think that would be. Yeah, that'd be awesome. And also, then we can get front row seats. Yeah, yeah. So I'd say get there a little early again. Fine. Yeah. He's supposed to be sending some swag to me mm -hmm. to like get out at the event. I haven't gotten it yet, uh, so I'll check with his assistant to make sure it got mailed out. But uh, he's giving a talk the next day in Chicago. Um, so yeah, he'll just be down here for a day or so. Is he got? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Are we going to take him out and get him drunk after the talk? I don't know that he drinks, actually. Not it is his birthday. Not even in Spanish? Uh, March 16th is Richard Solomon's birthday. Oh. It's also the day that Ubuntu officially switches to System D. <laughs> <laughs> oh! Oh, my God. Oh, oh, this is going to be an epic talk. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody should ask him about that. Okay. I mean, well, how you I mean, it's all free and open source too, so. Oh. Anyways, next option, our item. Uh, app Cacher. So we have a new system up and running now. Uh, I did this last night. It is a Debian repository, our own personal one. It's running two services. It's running uh, the App Cacher program, which allows you to also basically all our VMs point to this uh, repository. When a package is downloaded from them, so app gets installed, VTOP, for example, and it goes through the app cacher, checks if the package is already on there, and it's not a pull it down to the app cache system. So we have the cache of packages, so it helps speed things up. We always have to go out to a, the official Ubuntu repo, for example. Well, does it say you're an official Ubuntu repo on campus? I don't know. Yeah, they do. Okay, well, we have this. Uh, even, I mean, it's, still, it's on the same box, so maybe additional. Performance, I don't know. It's also a VM too, so I don't know. <coughs> Who knows? 
But in addition to the app cacher, it has another service which uh, we will do for itself, is that we have our own uh, repo. So you can add the appropriate uh, lines, Debian source lines, and actually query it and actually add it as a repository in your source in your app cache sources, and you can pull down packages from it. I have a GR security kernel package up there I did. Uh, for don't, it probably doesn't work. I haven't tested it. Um, but it can be used. And I'm probably going to, unless we have demand for it, I'm probably going to limit it just to our VM IP space. But if you also want to buy your own VMs or something on your laptop and use the same one, it might be worth just for testing just to have it out there available to everybody. Plus, you might get some better caches in there, fill it up quicker. Yeah, that's, that's true too. Yeah. Um, so, in the Puppet repository, take a quick look at it. So, um, here's the repo for it. We got, uh, sorry, in the modules repo directly. So, I created a module. And if we go to manifest here, we have uh, three things. You have the, or the, um, the init not PP, which loads both of them. You got the client configuration, the server configuration. If you go to the client configuration, we can see it, it's very simple. It does two things. It makes sure this 0 1 proxy file exists on the server, and then it copies this, the one that had in the, in the repository, to that. So that and this sets, sets up your, app, your, your local uh, app configuration to use as a proxy. But then also using this one one, which actually installs the appropriate uh, app sources file to this this location, then you can actually use it as a as a tree packages. And that looks like is simply this files. Um, you go to log list, and it's just these two lines here. Dev, the link or the URL to of the proxy, and then the the architecture. So you check that out. And for the server. Puppet, see repo or modules repo, CD. Yeah, so over here, take a look at server. <coughs> you can see how I built this entire server with like six, seven, eight, eight puppet types. Very simple. So this one, this is for the server. So the server installs these two packages and puts them in a variable called depths. So it's an array of the first package we require app cacher, and the second one we need to build the packages or to actually host them is the GPK G dash dev, and then we create this directory structure if they already exist. This just creates the folders var wwhtml we're just assigned to the variables now. We include Apache module, create another module for Apache to install Apache, most we'll of And we say, hey, for the package type, just install, make sure everything is present on the system, so just going to pull these two and run those. Then what we're going to do is the service is going to run next. So if, if once the package is installed, we require that, that one for it runs. So it's, you can do precedence here ordering. So once that's installed, then you run the app, yes, uh, the app cache or service, and it just runs through this puppet module or this puppet uh, type just figures out what init system you're using. Whether it's upstart, system DRC, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, we would use the appropriate command to pass that to the, to the, the start option of that. And then so this will actually become start, or in this case, service app cacher, dash cacher start. And then we copy over the configuration files, which, which is uh, a script that I wrote to help make uh, create the packages easier. And uh, the other configuration files. Pretty simple. Um, at this point, let's go ahead and log into it. Uh, uh, fork. I'm inside. Come real quick. Oops. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, it's much longer than that. That's kind of random. All right, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> much longer than that. It's not very random. <laughs> oh, gosh. Anyways, um, this app repo script, so you create a package, you drop it, everybody, so you want to create your package, you drop it in, one, in, the, in the appropriate architecture directory, and you can see here we have here's three, the two packages I created, Linux firmware image for brief 1.14 for the GR security kernel patches, and the header files for the GR security kernel patches. So I, I drop that in the AMD64 directory, and then all I have to do is run this update repo script, and that actually generates these packages.dz files, which are which are indexed at all. And then that's what your that's what app will pull down and figure out what's on your repository or what's available. So simple. You create a package, you drop it in the directories. This AMD 64, you put it there. If it's I386, you put it there, and then you just run the script, and you're done. They're now available. And I also uh, have this in, with Zen tools. So um, I've shown you this last week. I know we we did all the the puppet, the do over the entire configuration of our systems. Um, but Zen tools, just to recap real quick, 
We have, we have a residual repository. I have a role script now called repo. And every time you build a VM, this script actually runs and copies, goes ahead and copies the source.list log file to the VM. Well, it's now here, it's now as a brief, which is a temporary directory you want by just building the VM. That and then <coughs> announce the other proxy file to that, so it's on the system, and then you can immediately get these again. Okay, okay. Um, that concludes that. It's been a long time left, I too. Uh, next one, oh, that is it. There's three address for the repo servers that repo like the log or um, also, uh, moving into the meeting sections now and Linux notes, or Linux news. Uh, so, yeah, I'd like to announce that they will be officially switching over to System D next Monday. So, soon. Also, um, SAMBA 4.2.0 is released. There's some performance um, and compression uh, improvements in it in the release or in the notes here. Um, better clustering support, uh, snapshots also, that's kind of nice. Um, and Mark's thing is 4% of the three. Moving into education epoch, so Wayland posted these. Did you want to talk about any of Wayland? Uh, not really, it's just some introductory to Linux materials. Um, some of the comments that we get sometimes from people who are new at this kind of thing. It's really that new, but uh, is that they don't know where to start, and so I thought I would try to find some more user friendly stuff for people who weren't that familiar with their command line. Sounds great. So, yeah. so here's Linux survival. Okay, go to the um, notes here. A few graphs. Cool. I'm going to go to the old one, which was speaking language. Oh. Pronunciation, guys. Cool. Yeah, I can do it. Huh? I said, yeah, I can do it. What's that? That's the pound sign. I've never known how bad. So, yeah, someone's ever like, oh, you just type out a command and they're like, okay, no, type a bang or a splat or they're like, splat, splat, splat. And like, what does that mean? Well, now you know. Wait, what is the question mark? A watermark? Oh, a quark. Okay. A you guys call it a question mark? Crazy. An interrogation point. Did you say wild char? I thought that was an asterisk. You see, you're the expert. <laughs> it's the same old character. Memory. Well, it depends on where, where it is, but like in glob, in the bash shuttle, or if you're globbing, it's the same old character. Um, next. Oh, yeah. So this is a really cool. I do all these. I have like, I'm subscribed to like 20 or so of them. Uh, Stack Exchange has newsletters. And when you subscribe to a particular newsletter, you actually get the top like 10 questions asked for the week in your inbox. Highly recommend the Unix Linux one. I do subscribe to that one. And you get uh, top voted questions every week. So I always pick up some new stuff in the shell and uh, the Linux related tools. Um, I also subscribe to the reverse engineering one. And about, and, oh, I subscribe to 20 of them. So there's quite a bit in here. But uh, you check those out. I just try to look for the single e books. Ah, might have to join that one now, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, those are movies. Yeah, those are movies. That one is that. Uh, okay, well, it's pretty it's pretty 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 <laughs> <laughs> All right, so nothing for proc period. Um, actually, I thought I had some notes, but I almost forgot them. I'm going to save the uh, intruding users section part of the time. I can set up a general environment. I hadn't done so for this. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll shut that one for now. Uh, I guess the next one, uh, basically, just uh, pretty basic. <coughs> and sometimes I get uh, external abuse reports from people on the internet for hosts on the campus network, and they put all of their timestamps in Unix time. And so I was looking for an efficient way to convert those into UTC. So I modified some Python scripts that I have just to use that function. Um, and so now they, like, I have an XML parser that um, goes through all of these reports that I get and chunks them out into separate tickets so I can work on them individually. And as part of that on each one, it takes out the, uh, the epoch timestamp and just converts it into something that's user friendly. Um, so just a quick and easy command. It's just uh, date minus D uh, at and then whatever the timestamp time is. 
But here's the GNU long format. Yeah. Oh, and so that number is the is a representation of the number of seconds since uh, what is it? 1970, 19, yeah, January 1970. So he wanted to get the memory to percent house. Nope, increase space size a little bit here. Yeah, percent convert. And then, so it comes out to UTC by default. So you have to remember that UTC, depending on the time of the year, is either plus five or plus six. I'm sorry, minus five or minus six. So this how we keep our work for depending on your when your system um that's time we sync to. Oh uh, yeah, that's right. Uh so my VPSs are all on YouTube too. Yeah. What's the hardware clock or um systems what's the command sys hardware? Yeah. You must not have to solve other packages you can do a system to clock, you can sync with the hardware, you can also do clock, the hardware clock to the system. Isn't that HW plus? There's also a um, D1 uh, that's 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 line cuddle. Hmm? There's just some D tool for that. I think it's like uh, pine cuddle or something. Okay. Well, I wasn't aware of that one either. Oh, cool. I don't have systems on this. So. But uh, maybe I've never used this one, Lucian. Um, I only use it for uh, uh, installing the list. Looks like you can uh, set, set it there. So. Okay. And querying, it, querying is what we want. Uh, so dash dash set. Oh, you know what? This is the one. I'm sorry. This is what I was looking for. The option when I was talking to. I was just getting those confused. Okay. So, set the system timer from the hardware clock and assess the clock. Okay. This is it. That's my bad. I forget. How do we query it? I think you can just run sudo hw plus. Oh, yeah, right. I don't have dev RTC. Sure. Okay, well, um, this actually is probably because it's a VM. Maybe, uh, maybe that's, that's why that file's missing. Um, okay, well, we'll hold off. I'm pretty sure when you run it, it'll give you, it'll actually give you um, the the date on your RTC, and it'll also give you an offset from the system date. Like, you okay. know, you know right, right. in a very precise format. Oh, cool. And then um, the next one we have is DMI code. So it spends a lot of time from watching on the physical machine. And um, I want to know what it's taking model is. I'm on our remote. I don't know what it is. Again, I can call somebody from consulting. I need to know what this, what this model is. Cell power is what or something. Instead of calling up, a lot of times I can actually get that information by using um, querying DMI. And um, of course, we'll need a physical machine for this to try it out. But, um, We'll find out. Nope. So actually, you can see right here, reach from dev mem. There we go. That's all I want to show you. <laughs> so it is, it's, uh, shows you who the manufacturer is. And this is actually those, those Dell of Law eBay for $150 uh, CS24SC. We've got two more for OpenSM. And hopefully, we can have a four note cluster if I get, get funding for that. So. Yeah, we, uh, I used I used DMI to code in a script I wrote for a uh, place I used to work at for uh, for making uh, specification sheets for each unit. Oh, cool. It, it was for like we had a, a division of the company was uh, had sale, mm -hmm. so we we just used that for automated uh, spec sheets for everything. Okay, right. Yeah, and I'm working on a uh, a library that uses that too. Oh, cool. Well, do let me know if you think a next function will do that. Okay. Yeah. And what do we have next with um, talk ourselves? You really should start demoing these. Yeah. Um, you know, you can, I mean, again, just connect to Zoom. I don't have this shit solved on my computer. What, what, what's going to happen if I'm out here if I need to run logic? I'll install it. Anarchy, that's what. Yeah, it sounds like that's the, that's the wrong way to do it. Um, okay, so I'm going to run execute some random commands from John Shelf history. But uh, basically, I didn't know this, but uh, something innocuous here, like get status. So say get status. Wait, my status is very long, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry. 
Um, so to say it did kind of have a really lengthy command that you didn't want to type in again, and you thought it was kind of uh, laborious to have to come up here and copy and paste this back into your terminal prompt. You could just do something like this, and it would run that command again. Um, so pretty simple. I actually didn't know that. <laughs> I just, uh, no, somebody showed it to me the other day. Like, yeah. So I just had to figure that the other day. I thought it was useful. Yeah, I but think if you if you, you do the like leading character of a command, I'll run that command again. Do I know? Like, if you do bang and say again. If you do like bang and then get, and then it'll just run the entire command. Yeah. F. Yeah. Okay. It's first match. Okay, so it's it's the first thing in your history that it matches that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. First thing going backwards? Yes. Right. So even if you just went bang G, right, it would still. I think, like, you press tab, it'll be answered. Oh, you're not. You're not. You're not. You're not. You're not. Yeah, I think if you also if you man history or man bash or something, there's all kinds of things. That's all going to work on the BSC song. <laughs> <laughs> It says computers on the floor over there, so you can just kick it. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, the uh, the history expansion system is pretty uh, pretty advanced in cash. Right. Yeah, we, should do, we should do a further talk about like the replacements. Yeah. There's and a then lot picking of the particular arguments from the previous command or something. Yeah. That'd be a good one. I'm afraid you did. Next. Yeah. So next week. Oh yeah, speaking of that, and we'll be here next week or the week after. We'll begin again in April. We got spring break and um fall next week. So. All right, so next, then we heard of Open BZ. So this was the um so it's another OS operating system virtualization. Um Engine runtime. So essentially, before Docker, they're OpenVZ. It's a container system, and um, it's a little different. It's not. It never got incorporated in the mainline kernel, so you have to download a modified kernel. And they have they have the package from since OS. So you, you add the repository and you or you install the uh, VZ kernel. Um, but it's, it's it's kind of a pain in the ass because of that. So you have to. Make sure you have the right, right kernel. Um, the correct kernel that they had patches for, otherwise it won't work. And that's a blind on top, right? Um, so I had to, I was trying to find the sense of was which one matches. It's like 6.2, a minimal version of 6.2 match. So I created a bigger block out of this thing that was to try it out. But um, it's kind of cool. One advantage, or two advantages I have right off the bat over Docker is that um, it has its own scheduling system. So you can actually do uh, like limit the number of processes that are running. You can say, hey, I don't want any more than 200 processes in this container. Docker doesn't have that. It's a hack the way they're doing it now because the namespace is in the secret, so we need control over that right now in this kernel. To do it in Docker, you have to use like, a, a daemon, the actual uh, init scripts. In, our, in my case, I use an island to actually limit that so people can't port bomb my containers. And what I would do is I would say upstart, upstart was on Docker, right? And you apply the, um, what we call us, limits. Security limits to the upstart daemon is then gets passed to the child processes, so that ends up being the containers. And you can then use mlock to actually limit the uh, this problem with this problem much limits in the shell. And um, or in the case of upstart, it has their own limit. it has their own system which follows the same idea. So common one, I think I do mprop 200 in the upstart script. And then it says, hey, no container can have more than 200 processes running at the same time. So they were running, you know, the, 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 the recursive shell function that's commonly, um, the company that's like online everywhere, it would stop at 200. So, which works. Uh, so, to check that, uh, that's one of the things. The other thing is that built into this, they have their own um, disk loopback system. And it's called Ploop. It's based off Loop. Now, uh, by mining Loop uh, back devices. They call it Ploop, it's their own. Um, and then what they do, it, it allows you to actually specify the amount of storage for each device. 
So Docker does not have this capability unless you use device mapper as a storage backend. Then you can set um, dm dash dot like size equals to whatever it is. It only works for that particular storage backend, and the other would support it. But using uh, OpenVZ, you can actually limit the container. So no one can just like run yes, type into a, a file or uh, revert to a file, and then you know, fill this, for example, especially if you work on shared container systems. So it's kind of nice. Just from my perspective, two things I thought were kind of interesting about OpenVZ. Now, I do have a repository up for this. So if you want to plug in OpenVZ, and if any, I'll get it up our Zen system. So it only runs on uh, kernel hack CentOS? No, it's supported in others, but it's not going to be easy to install it from the way it looks. So the kernel hack CentOS is the easy to do it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Vagrant, you can go here, and then we can go down to OpenVZ. So, if you call my Vagrant repository, you can actually type Vagrant up, you have it installed, and then you'll have a brand new machine with OpenVZ installed. And you can get right here, just a quick, quick look. Um, we actually, first of all, we get their repo file, right? Copy it to the young repo that you We then import their GPG key, verify the packages. So can be so they can be signed, or I'm sorry, we can verify the signatures. Then what happens is we actually uh, install VZ and the package is this, this right here, this, uh, well, VZ kernel is what the kernel we need. We also need the VZ control tool, uh, Plume, and VZ coil. These you don't actually need these two. These are just extra features. We're going to play around with different things, but I went ahead and did them all for this. Um, at that point, we're going to go ahead and bring it up. I haven't really done much with this. I just did it last night. Um, so I've got a vagrant open VZ, vagrant up. Took me a little bit to find the vagrant box. So I was uh, at work, the, the appropriate signal as well. So I found this one. You called it SOS, but it's because you showed it to the debut box. Oh, no. That's just some folks I copied. Uh, those don't actually get executed because they won't they won't get chance to see what OS you're running and if that condition will never be met, so we'll never set it to debut. Um, I, I try to get my scripts um, somewhat agnostic as far as the lead distributions go. So you see here, if it's Debian, we test it up here. So here if it's dead, we if find this file it's Debian or Ubuntu or whatever. If we find this file, it's, it's our ELP system, right? And then whether it's different or not, it'll install those packages. So I have these functions and actually check which system it's on, check the packages are installed, and then use these based on what like that very probably an OS and run the appropriate install script. So. But yeah, if you have an OS or a Debian box, that will fail. There's common basis. All right, waiting. Does anybody else have anything to talk about tonight after this, this demonstration? No. There's mm -hmm. no. Yeah. Asshole. Huh? What? What did you say? Are we going to approve everybody? Oh. <laughs> Curious what kind of person you are. <laughs> Shut up. You just you ain't good, man. <laughs> That's the last one, guys. Just put in a request for food. It's been a long time since we hmm. got, got that money out of them for Linux first. Which is that you? Yeah. What the hell? I don't know why I'm here a second. I've never had this slope of some sort of party here at all. Um, in the meantime, I'll go to the business today. So, we then want to demo this one right here. So, essentially, what we're doing is, and I'll set them up on first. Let's do, um, anything cool to look at? It looks like an image file. Cool, thank you. I 
it's a complete gimmick. <laughs> Open this one. Oh, there we go. All right, looks like shit. What we're doing is the first one says we're reading everything from the file, right? It's an uh, it's, uh, operator to match everything. And the next one is, hey, everything after this uh, bin is going to execute through a, a probably exec VE system call. And then after that, what's going to happen is going to take the output of that and it's going to end up being uh, XXD. So what happens to that, that'll actually be the result that's in our window. Do this. And now we'll just type that. Bin is now a hex editor. Right. Or a hex viewer, that you should rather say. Um, you, can, you can play around with that. You can see this one from Photoshop. Yep. Imagine type. I imagine it was a JFIF. I imagine number and some other binary stuff. So it's just a viewer, right? You can edit it, the file, and I can do it. I want to destroy it. You can also use, there's actually a package called text edit. Yeah. You see, I have to install a hex and then I think it's more robust. I just wondered, like, does it, is this only for reading or can you actually write to the file? Well, well I, I don't want to write to that file, file no. but you can use your, your own little bin control. Like, like if it, it just write to some file and then scan it. And yeah. I'm wondering if it'll just look like this or if it'll actually write the binary. Yeah, it's still going to do this. Okay. Um, that's not, um, okay, so view only. Um, should I have a machine here? Is this straight off? Oh, well, it's still up though. It's down there now. So. Let's connect to it. All right, so at this point, we have uh, open, we're in the open VZ, VZ system. You can see the main tool we want to use is VZ control, and we can do VZ, or there's a bunch of other tools too. VZ, this is a crap ton of them. VZ list tells you the containers that are running. I have one container running at this point called 101, right? And you can do a com command called VZ, um, well, VZ console allows you to attach to the container. So you can log in properly with the login uh, program, username and password. Um, we want to do VZ set. Oh, well, yes, this is to use that, but uh, VZ, I'm sorry, it's not VZ set. It's, it's uh, set, okay. You specify the container number and then some information about it. Like I think you can do um, dash dash mem. And I'm going to save it with uh, use one gigabyte of memory. And then let's look at that parameter. AG. Let's take a look at the mem. Uh, well, super phones. All right. Oh, no matter for that. Well, we'll just have to take a look at this then. Or let's just try a different option. I'm going to switch our side. Whatever the syntax is, uh, CPU one two that was no fuck. It's ambiguous. Dash dash description. I remember was one. Um, test container. So we'll call it. And then we have used patch to the save operator. Now save the configuration file. One cool thing about this is that every config is its own configuration file. So you can just literally just edit this. And you can get all kinds of information from uh, TCP uh, receive buffers to page caches, to number processors, et cetera, all on this. And you can say, I don't feel bad for writing Islet in the way it did because if you look at this, this is a bunch of shell variables. So you can actually tell how they reference it right there, right? So can you feel a little bit better about Islet whenever after looking at this? <laughs> so we don't, I don't know. I still need to be weird in Python or something like that. For the ease. Anyway, so that, that's it. And then you can you got your commands. Like, like I can uh, bring it down. I think it's stop. So you say, I want to stop container 101. Oops. I want to destroy container 101. No. Nope. Why am I feeling so much? Oh, yeah, because I forgot to set. 101, set, stop. Order? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. So we need more arguments. What else do we need? Yeah, which is a better help? Um, Destroy. Actually, I'm, I'm an idiot. I don't need that. <laughs> uh, worst demo in the world. All right, there you go. We're stopping the container because I barely messed with it. Like, it was like literally, I got the VM, I got bigger box working than I pretty much completed. So I'm getting this pretty much live. Um, start 101. 
And one thing about this, you can see there's the flute device that I talked about earlier, the using the flute package, so mount, it mounts that and plays with it. And there's a cool thing about this is uh, you can actually mount the file systems. So those VZ mount um, commands and VZ unmount might just be for control. And what you can do is you can mount the container to your uh, to a mount point in your file system, and you can go through and edit the files that way. So if you want to configure any file, you can do that directly. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and one other cool thing was setting the password. I'll talk about this more. I'm going to learn more about this, but um, there was an option for the password. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, I'll just look, this will be easy. Just look my history. So um, we're using a Bluetooth container at this point, and you use VC Control, Create, you use this white OS template, and there's all kinds. And we use this tool right here to show you the available container types. And with that run, that's going to list them all in just a moment. SUSE, Ubuntu, Fedora, Scientific, Debian, and so on. So you can always use these as your file system for the container, which is kind of cool. And then you specify what you create. Let's go back to the history here and just match anything that you see. And what we're going to do, we're going to create 101, to specify the template, and then say a basic configuration. That just runs with this feature, which is with their sample script, but basic, it's just basic install information. Um, container stuff are in private, and you can see a bunch of other commands right here. So, I don't know, we'll play with a little more later. I'm going to get used to it. I'm going to support an island, but honestly, if it just supports like one kernel version it's, or very limited, it's going to be a pain in the ass. Nobody's going to use it, so it's probably not worth it. But a lot of, a lot of uh, VPS providers, they actually use this. When you log into your VPS, you're actually inside like an open VPS. Commands. But a lot of them use this stuff for years, so it's kind of cool. All right, going to uh, finishing up in vicinity, uh, control P. Have you ever heard of the control P the plugin? Super sweet, right? So um, that's perfect. So we're opening the VM. I want to open up. It's a fuzzy finder, file manager, right? So what you actually just type, you, type, you literally hit control P and you begin typing, and it'll match any of the files in the directories. And I'm gonna I'm gonna match a vagrant file, and you can see. It's finding them all, right? And I can select the one right there. So I'm in the open VD directory. Let's open the new tab. You control P again. And I'm with the readme file to match the first one, which is in the directory. I don't actually have to complete the path ever. It automatically will find it for you using a fuzzy finding algorithm. So that's really nice. Uh, so, anyways, to install that, you have pathogen. Um, if you want all these things that I've, we've been doing in here, uh, you can also get them from my files or my bin files repository and just download it and then run um which I can show you real quick. For anybody that's interested in, in that it's pretty sweet uh, bin configuration at least if I do say so myself that I'm working on. Uh it's the same yeah. Um yes. whoops not that files bin files kept up with some but you can you can clone this repository and you can run this use script and then it'll actually you know, send this to your MRC, back up your stuff, send it to your MRC, and then I'll import it to my repository, which is what I have here. You got the main, take a look here, got the BIM, last one. Um, this is here anyway. Uh, the MRC is a link to the repository, right? Anyway, so if you want to check that out, you can. And control P you can just download and install the pathogen. So the mine is pull the plugins into your directory structure in bundle, for example. And I would do git clone and then that program and it'll put it in their directory and then the pathogen will actually recurse through those and load the appropriate plugin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, next is something. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> next, my bad, dude. <laughs> I guess most folks don't really know much about this, but I figured I'd talk about it because it's kind of useful. Uh, so recent versions of Vim actually support uh, a tabbed uh, buffer, have a tabbed buffer system. So instead of the old way where you had to sort of, um, uh, I guess, know what buffers you had open, you could list them, but it wasn't really like a consistent display like you might be used to it on a Google editor. Uh, they added tab support, so it's nice. Uh, so the, the basic uh, the basic uh, syntax for the command is tab and then something. So uh, you can see if I just do tab, there's a lot of commands related to the tab system. Uh, 
a lot of which I do not know anything about. So I'll just give you the basics. Um, so if we just do, I think, yeah, tab new, we'll just open a new tab. And uh, you can see the bar at the top appearing, and that's your list of tabs that you have open. Uh, you can also do tab edit. And tab edit accepts an argument um, of a file name, so you can just open a file that way directly. Uh, so if we do, um, if we were to, and So uh, the regular edit command will just open a file in the uh, in the buffer you're currently working in. So if we're to open file one, there we go, it's open. Uh, now let's say you want to work at file on file two at the same time. You can just type uh, tab E or tab edit, the same thing, uh, and then two. And now you have two tabs. And uh, if you have mouse support enabled in them, uh, you can actually select tabs using the mouse. Uh, it doesn't look like uh, John has them on here. I don't think this uh, terminal, terminal supports that, but uh, you can see this X button up here uh, will actually function in that case as, and it will close the current tab if you click it. Uh, but the, the more traditional way to switch between tabs is to use the GT, uh, the GT key stroke. Uh, so if you press GT, uh, that will actually, let me first open up a third one just so you can see this more easily. Um, okay, so those are out of order, but you get the idea. Uh, so we're currently on the second tab, which is by a file name three. Uh, we can move to the next tab by pressing GT, and we can do this repeatedly to switch tabs one by one. Uh, if you know a specific tab number you want to go to, uh, you can also switch to that directly by passing a number argument to GT. So let's say we want to switch to the first tab. We just press one GT, and that will go directly to it. We can also do that for any of the tabs. So if we do 3GT, that will go to the third tab, which is confusingly named 2, because I opened it in the wrong order. Uh, and there actually is a tab move command, uh, I think. Can you rename know. tabs? Uh, rename them? Yeah. Um, I think there's, I'm not sure. I'll check that in a minute. Okay, um, no problem. Oh, that's what it is. Okay, so. Like I said, I'm not super familiar with this, but uh, okay, that's a little easier to see because it's in the right order now. Uh, and of course, you can map uh, whatever key sequences you want. Uh, the great thing about them is you can you can customize it however you want. Um, so you know, at home, I have I have uh, key bindings mapped to move tabs around, so I don't have to type the commands by hand. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna point for my new files. Uh, press tab. Oh yeah, press yes, yeah, press tab. Okay, on the keyboard. Oh. <laughs> oh. And the other one is hit control T. Oh, would that open known? Yep. Two bunch of spots. Okay. Then you can just tap through. Tap button. Okay. So then you have to have the plugin for this, right? Or you could. I, I, it's just tab. a remap. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's basically some Firefox keys. Um, I think you do. Well. So is one, two, and three all all tabs that hold the same buffer, which is why they all say test? Uh, no, that's because I, I created three files uh, with the same content, so let's change that real quick. Oops. So. so then does each tab have to have a unique buffer, or can tabs uh, share buffer? You can actually you can uh, you can share a buffer. So uh, like let's say we do uh, tab edit um, two, then we have two twos. And if we um, append the both, you can see the the plus signs both just appeared at the top here because they are uh, simultaneously editing the same thing. So if we go back to another one, you can see it appeared. Can you do that one? I don't know. Uh, I just I just did tab edit two. Okay. So I just opened it. Yeah, it's the, it's the same procedure as so, yeah. Um, 
So, okay, what else? Uh, so, there's also the G capital T uh, keystroke, which will go back a tab, uh, similar to GT to G lowercase T. So, if you do G capital T, and that's the same thing as uh, if you have the, the plugin or if you map it yourself, you can press uh, shift tab. But G, G capital T will work on default kind of configuration. Uh, and also, it, it accepts a numerical argument, but it works slightly different than uh, normal GT because it's a, it's a relative movement instead of a uh, absolute movement. So, with with G lowercase T, if you specify an argument, it will switch directly to that tab number. Uh, whereas with G capital T, if you specify a numerical argument, it will switch backwards that many of tabs, that many number of tabs. So, if we go to QGT and then we press. Uh, to G capital T, instead of moving to tab number two, it will actually move back two, two tabs to the left, uh, and, and that will result in you being on tab number one. And it will also roll over. So if you do that again, you'll be back on tab three. Uh, we're going to check out tab renaming. I'm not sure if there's, yeah, I don't think there's a uh, title. I, I don't know. You know. I assume that if there's a way to uh, rename any sort of buffering, then that it would be consistent with the tab operations too. So I just don't know how to do that because I just leave it open. So. And one thing that is kind of cool about uh, about this is if we actually I shouldn't have put that, but um, uh, let's just do um, So uh, right now we're in the temp directory, and if we open them and we um, let's just open the tab here. Let's edit. Uh, oops. So if we have something like this where we're we're seeded into a directory and we want to edit a file that's not in the current directory, uh, the the way the default tab line is set up, and you can kind of uh, to use your own function to generate this line here. That's the top line that displays the tab. Uh, the default function that creates it will actually abbreviate uh, directory names, which is kind of neat because uh, it, it, it lets you display more on the screen, I guess. So you can see the O stands for one, T stands for two, and the other T stands for three. So I thought that was kind of neat. Um, yeah, I guess that's pretty much all there is to say. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody interested in seeing how I do the remaps to make it really easy? And switch between the tabs. This is tab tab section, tab navigation like Firefox. You can see when you shift tab, go back, tab go forward, uh, tab two, and uh, tab or control T, tab new, control M for uh, tab two. Um, that concludes the sessions. Been saying, been having talks uh, about real projects. So, if anybody, do uh, you get access to the um, repository? So, what that happens is you keep creating the account, like after I'm already asleep, and by the morning, the uh, key has expired. So, it won't okay. send the digital password. When I try resetting it, it says it's sending it. It says remote lookup was correct, but it's not actually sending me an email. If you like, go set it right now to root or something, I'll go in and change it. Let me go ahead and remove you. It's a cool email address. Yeah, yeah, cool email address. No, it's not Sam's. Yeah. Oh. Sam's got a Very slow response. All right. Sorry. Sam, I hear you on the first time. What do you want to be? Uh, Silver Oh, yeah. Okay. So at this point, I agree. Okay. 
Uh, anybody else that does not have it, um, access to the systems, let me know. I'll create. I'll create. Uh, okay. You need access? Okay. You need to go ahead and do these users here. What's your name? Say again? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I-A-N. I-A-N? Yeah, P-I-C? I'm sorry, I can't hear you at all. E-I-A-N space P-I-C-K P-I-C-K? E-R-I-N-G and okay, sorry, that was just, uh, and what do you want your uh, username to be? Okay. Your email? I P I C K. I P I C K E R I N. Okay. P E R E R U. Two. Two. Gmail. Gmail. Okay. Thank you. Ian Ray. Um, but that was correct then? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, okay, so at this point, I'm pretty much kind of him. You should get an email, and um, do go ahead and verify that right away, like Sam. Yeah, it's working for me. Excellent. I said it's working for me. Everything's good. Okay, so excellent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was great. Yeah, that's hilarious. All right, so anyways, uh, now. Can you just like repeat everything, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> John, <laughs> could, could you hear him from there? Could you yeah, hear I could hear him. Oh, I'm over That's here. why it's driving me crazy. I was like, John. Well, you guys, you guys should have, you guys should have stepped off and then said, repeated it for me. Like a repeater, you know. You know, like a hub network. I just thought your auditory faculties were functioning properly. <laughs> they may have not been. I, I couldn't hear anything. By the time his name got over there, it'd be a completely different name. We should have started calling for Yeah. <laughs> So um, Ian and Sam, I'm going to add you guys to uh, to the groups. Um, I guess it goes to order here. And Sam, why are you so slow? That's strange. Much faster. Now we're done. Try it. Complete it. You guys are now going to be developers in love. All right, so everybody that wants to access our repositories, I'm sorry, access our um, the private projects that we have, people who play with Puppet, do um, and you want access to our VMs, uh, go ahead and upload your private or your public key. To do that, I'm going to show you, I'm going to demo the slide, and you, you just follow along, or uh, if you're not interested in that, I guess don't. Um, so, we're going to, um, so once you log in here, at that point, you're going to need to go to the projects. So, projects, uh, log puppet. You don't actually, what you need to do is you need to clone uh, the repository, and you're going to need to, you're going to, need to um, already configure this. So, uh, when you first log in, you need to go to your profile. Right here, profile settings. The first thing you need to do is add an SSH key. So create an SSH key on your host, copy the public key into here, and then you'll be using that to access the systems. Um, and then once that's finished, you go back to the projects, you will clone it, and then um, get clone that address. And what we're actually going to do is the point you configure your um, SSH config file to use for GitLab. So, well, I think I do give you love. So, probably go ahead and put this in your SSH config file. Hostar.gnu.log.org, your username. You don't have one yet, but I'll, we'll create that for everybody. And then the, the private key is going to use to log in. So use that same key pair if you want for it to get in that server. And if you have any questions, I uh, do a care of this information. Um, I'm going to go ahead and click out of this. And then um, what's going to happen is so then you'll be allowed to actually um, clone the repository. So you actually need to do that first. 
And then we'll go into modules, we'll go into common, we'll go into manifest, and this directory contains user information. And you can see every user has its own class. So I'll go ahead and create these. Well, first of all, do you guys want E and Lucian, uh, Sam, do you guys want access to our VMs? Our VPNs? Our VMs, virtual machines? Uh, yes, I believe that I'm going to need them to work in this project, right? Right. Okay, so let's go ahead and get this out of the way. I don't have to do this anymore unless somebody else. Uh, I'm just saying that because I mean, I, so we can start getting on the project. So, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and create the group, the names for you guys. So you're next. Um, evolution first. Um, whoops. Uh, El and Lucian. We have the last name unless you care. Um, then we'll do um, Albonsu for the username, and you're going to be user ID uh, 2003. Next will be Sam and SilverDev. For the username, you can do it without a Sam. Either will work. Which preference? Which one? Sam. Okay. So nobody uses like, computer login names. Okay, awesome. By the way, nice way to get. GitLab uses the same gravatar as GitHub, so when you actually put up an existing project, everything works correctly, looks correct. Oh, nice. I didn't think I was. Um, and then Ian? We have to change the, uh, the thing for Sam, too. Uh, I have to change UID. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, Sam, you have, no, I would have to change this one yet. What? You guys know you can there's incrementers and decrementers. Control thank you. I couldn't remember what the incrementer was. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, control and control X. Um oops, that's too high. So control X 2005. And this is Ian's. Uh, Ian, do you have a preference on your username for login? No, I just think. You see Ian? And then hit green. Okay. Now at this point, if you guys want to generate your own password, uh, let me know. I'll need the hash. So you can use the MK password tool. You can do um, MK password, get it installed. You can add this later, but once you have the repo dash M, SSH 512. And I'll just type in, hit enter, it's the password that generates the appropriate uh, uh, shadow file form with the salt, the hash, and the algorithm that's used. And it's using uh, 512. That's okay. Okay, so um, in top here, that's done. Otherwise, you won't, you won't be able to use it until you guys set your passwords. Well, I'm not giving you super privileges anyway right now. Uh, and then at this point, I just add these two new ones to go to the one uh, user's class or member's class. And it's going to actually, if you have one of those, it's going to go ahead and vote with these up there. So. To uh, hold on to you. Sam, and let's do it. you all. In a moment, let's test it. So this is also I'm also going to go through what, what testing is like with this system. So go back. So we, we made our changes to, to our stuff. Now we need to, before we start the repository, we need to test to make sure there's no syntax errors. We don't introduce errors in the command history and make it a lot cleaner. By omitting those. So we have the Vagrant file right here. So I already have the Vagrant VM. It can fix there. All you have to do is type Vagrant up once you have this repository. Also, if you guys haven't closed this repository yet, please do. Um, if you need any help, do let me know. So remember, the first thing we do is add your SSH key to your profile setting in the GitLab system. And then configure um, your system, your, your SSH config, to actually use the appropriate private key when cloning from the GitLab system. Which is what I showed earlier. Um, Say again. Okay, then just go ahead and start start one. Uh, literally, just do. Uh, yeah. So you just need to do the SSH key gen to create the key, right? No, I have the key. You have the key. All right. So then all you need to do is just create a new file. That uh, slash config, and literally just put. I mean, all you need is just like three lines. And the lines you want are 
Okay, so you, you want these lines right here, so uh, you want that. You don't, you always, you can just bring those three lines in there and we'll be fine for you. Of course, change your identity file to your private key. And let me know when you're ready for that. You see that all right? Yeah. Okay. Now, um, once you have that in there and you uploaded your, your private part of your public key to the, to the GitLab web server, then at that point, um, do uh, the git clone of the pup, of the larger pub repository. So here it is right here. Graphic, here's the config or the uh, URL for it. And then what you'll do is you do git clone, and then that, of course, I'm sure you're familiar with git. And then they'll actually use that key to actually pull it down. This is a cell phone. Um, this is a cell phone. Uh, say again? This is an SSL problem. SSL problem? Uh, no, you, you have to use SSH for this. So use the, um, so there's two links up here. Okay, so you have to use the SSH file. Oh, okay. Okay, so the vagrant box is up. At this point, um, I already created this little provision script for you, or the actual does it for you. So you just run doc slash vagrant underscore provision underscore pop it SSH. And that's actually going to apply all the changes I just made in the public modules to this VM just to make sure there's no syntax errors and that they actually create all the new accounts. And it looks like we're done. There is now three new accounts for Lucian, Sam, and Ian. Right there. So if that works, I can actually put that up to the repository now. Um, very simple workflow right that you can see there now. Right? You just make your changes to the config and then run the bigger provisioner and apply it to the machine and see if it works. If it works, that's what you want, then you go ahead and upload it. So I'm going to go ahead and add the config, right? And I'm going to do git config or git commit, and we're going to say this is uh, common users.pp file, add three new users. Okay, I'm going to push it up. And then what I'm going to do in this window, I'm going to go to, I'm going to connect to Hammy. Hammy is the Zen uh, hypervisor. And then I'm going to go to the SE Puppet directory. And we have a cron job that runs every hour to do all the automatic pulls and the Puppet apply, but I don't want to wait till the next hour. I want to do it right now. So then I just run dot slash Puppet apply. Push another row on your workstation. Unless you want to install a load on your workstation. And um, it's going to create those accounts on the, this system. And then as the cron job runs for all the other systems, there'll be new users for each one of you. And it looks like I forgot to get pulled in. I get pulled. Yeah, there's the new changes. And now I'm going to public apply. And um, Ian, were you able to pull in that? Yeah, but apparently this is an attempt. Um, use the VirtualBox module. The what model? The VirtualBox module online. Oh, did you do the Baker now? No, I mean I can't run the Baker at all. Okay, but you were able to clone the repository? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. Where are Let me see that. I'll see that in a second. Um, Sam, sorry, sorry. Okay. Like where the user can take store it in this uh, puppet file? Uh, the directory. The they are in um, modules, common, manifest, and then uh, users.pp. You guys don't need and the only time you need that is if you're set your password. Um, We, we don't need to do those, we need to add your SSH and that's why this is failing, because it's looking for, what do you know, um, Oh, damn it, I got groups off. Group 2003 already exists. 2005 is not unique. Oh, you know what? And there's no packages that create new users, I guess. You think that's a problem? Let's find out. 
Is the Apache a Christian Apache user? Yes. So OSX. That's the culprit. So what we're going to do is, that is correct, Sam. Um, uh, we're going to do var. Well, let's actually just get rid of OSX. Um, There's not a good way to do this, so I just want to give it a fuck right now. And then what we're going to do is we're going to group delete OSX. Oh yeah, see so there are users first, so there's three users. Um, user delete dash r OSX. In. and then R, and then go back to group delete. And so this, you can already see that these two systems are now identical between the virtual box VM or the bigger VM in this machine. We are close to both. So every once in a while something like this will come up, but now we pretty much know how to fix it. Let's do uh, whoops. get ENT, take a look at it again, and then we see uh, now 202 is the last one. So now this should work. So let's apply it now, right? Apply. Now I'll just see what is a way to configure OS to actually take a range of user IDs. Okay, so while that's running, Ian, uh, let's see what your problem you're having on quality or uh, Okay, yeah, so you don't you won't actually run this on your system. Okay, so uh, you're going to edit. Uh, so hit do that in LS. Just take a look at it. Yeah. So whenever you want to make changes, you'll do it in here locally with the modules directory. And then what will actually happen is you'll test it with the vagrant uh, commands. And you vagrant, yeah, as long as you have vagrant on your box, and then that will actually provision there. Once you type vagrant up, it actually grabs everything in the modules directory and manifests the entire public configuration and it applies, it, applies it to the vagrant box by default. So uh, the only time you actually push something up is when you actually verify it, like I did, where I, I went ahead and added U3 as a user, where it in their box and it worked, and then I, I put it up. And then we had a, a different issue on the, on the server. But we know it's not a public configuration issue, but that works. So um, it's like you everything you need. Uh, and then just a moment, you should actually, well, actually, you should be able to access the system now. So do um, SSH, everybody that, is following the part. Everybody wants to try to count um, SSH dash I and then your key, right? Or since you're having your config file, just do um, do a zen dot So pretty much this is all you need if you set your if you set your config file. Right? Your SSH config. You do that. Does that does that work? No. It's no, because we never actually updated our uh, public keys. Uh, like oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I, I forgot that step. That's right. So that's only possible for you guys. Okay, so once you have, thanks, Sam. Um, here's what you need to do. This is where you guys come to play. Both of you, you're at the same, you're in, you have the repository clone then? Excellent. Okay, so um, go into the modules. SSH directory, go to files, then go to authorize keys, and then create the key in there, or I'm sorry, just drop your public key in there as the name of your user. So for Ian, you would you would do you copy the base to the key to uh, Ian, for example, right? If you have the key. However, however you want to get that variable, for example. Um, so it has to match your username, though, because the function actually knows that's how it knows where directly to put it in. So, um, like I say, here's what we do: we do touch Sam, and then we do Sam. We open it up and copy and paste the public key in there. And then, once you do your local machine to be a Vagrant install, you will want to go back. Or you actually can start Vagrant up from here. I already have it running. 
I don't know, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I'll get right. And then what you're going to you want to know, you want the vagrant prohibition on which you can go to, you can either type vagrant prohibition dash dash, well, actually, it's type vagrant provision, and then it'll actually run the config. But they'll run the, the puppet configuration on, on that box. Let me know if, so, did you know? It's fine. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, one of the first things. You may have to reuse it. I see there's a new package for no, that. Because the V-Box one. Yeah, I'm just Oh, uh, do LS and prep for uh, that DKS module. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Once the connection has connected to the agent, you don't have to keep uh, re-authorizing or unlocking your key every time. Screen. Um, you want to forward your agent to our box? No, I I don't use GNOME, so I don't have GNOME terminal with that actually thing. So every time I do an SSH, a git command that's remote, I enter my key and unlock it. Oh. I tried using a space agent, like I thought that would start the day, but I didn't. Yeah, I don't know where to call how much. Uh, I know, yeah, uh, for uh, most people run with their with their X window system as a first process, so that's like, inherited in all the environments uh, in the GUI. Yeah, most people put that up there in the uh, uh, exit. Yeah. Okay. Um, you have to Google that on the top of my head. Yeah. Now, luckily, I've never had to do it because OS 10 has a credential helper. It'll actually say that it keeps for you. I mean, yeah. I don't know teaching, but I'm trying to do the same items with this terminal or something. Okay, I've never used no teaching. Um, so, so you, you said you said the public key though, right? Yes, that's. Did you said the sh config file? Yeah, no, that is. It, it, I can push and pull easily. Just have to, you know, re-enter a monkey every time. It's slightly annoying. It's totally pushed. Oh, you said the password key is in here. What? You said the password? Yes. Yeah, okay. Do you not? No. Well, it depends. Depends on what I'm doing. Uh, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But yeah, for these, I'm not doing that. But I see what you're saying. Um, but this stuff's not that important to me, you know what I mean? Just look stuff. Well, how do you need confidential information so that you don't get from these? Okay, so for you, you, you're having. I'm trying to get that. I don't actually have permission to push in this project. Okay, let's see here. That's all right. Small, small here. Small, small. Is it DKR or DRK? The I think it's called the Oxford. That's just a management tool. Um, oh, this is the oh, VBox here. I'm sorry. That's right. So let's go VBox. Why don't you have them off? Um, what are you writing in here? Um, oh, oh, so, this is actually even I said. Um, okay, I think I have a problem. I use a I use a curl. Okay, and I think I have another curl that I just loaded because it works better in mine. So, okay, I think I can do it. All right, cool. Yeah, so there's nothing. Yeah, you're missing that module. And uh, Sam requested a. Um, a machine, so you don't have to install a uh, Vagrant on your on your local host. I should have a virtual machine that everybody can log into and run Vagrant there. I'll probably be working on that sometime soon if someone else wants to do that.
Um, Oh, I'm saying sorry. Well, what, what, what was happening with you? Uh, I can't actually push because we have your only position. Oh, really? Yep. Oh, message from Skidmap. Mm -hmm. Is it because you consider a production branch? Or else you have that information um, that we both set differently? Well, we'll find out. Let's just change it to master and see if that works. That will be the quickest way to find out whether it's that, which I'm sure it is. Um, so we'll pop it. Settings. Or, um, no, I need to do, can I do this here? Uh, good. Change Sam to master. Okay, uh, Sam, your master. Let's try that. Okay. Let's see. Yes, that's totally pushed. Oh, really? Okay, well, everybody else needs to have more permissions. <laughs> to this particular project. Um, and just remember, be very careful when you work on these things because. Um, this goes to all the systems, so if you do something that happens to break everything, it'll break everything, it'll break all the systems. Um, just for the sake of uh, easiness and the fact that you know, uh, convenience makes people more productive because they're more likely to do something, uh, I'm giving access to you know, just to everybody, uh, just for the help. So just be careful and always test the stuff in the air before. I don't want to get lost in this weather interface. Mike, does it look like you Yes. The master is set as a protected branch under protected branches, and you have to have the master permission to push to protected branches, which is what's happening. Okay, thank you. Um, so, question How am I picking protected? Uh, you would go to, to the project. Uh, I'm sorry. You, thanks, uh, yeah, you have push to it right there, so you yeah. just click it, and then you go to settings, uh, protected branches, oh, thank you. and if you scroll down, you press the unprotect button in red at the bottom. So the next step, protected branches, is below here. I didn't see that first either. Okay. Thank you for that. Well, anyway, you just taught me something new, something bitch. That's what I like about it. And besides GitHub is not the feature, but I guess it is designed to encourage people to like create copy branches and do pull requests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that, that makes sense. Um, all right, so now I can actually make you put you back to um, developer. Yeah. You can see how much I suck at one of the interfaces. I'm just clicking around. Oh, I need to. Uh, so let's go numbers. And then do uh, Sam and then you take you back to a developer and try that again. Um, uh, say Lane. Is it, spoke, is it pronounced Lane? It's pronounced uh, Lane. Lane, okay. Cool. And then, all right. So, Ian, um, can you see, can you go ahead and if you haven't already, add your file here? Uh, this is complaining when I tried log forming it and the normal curl. What'd you say? 
Um, when I try my burning it, it gives me that torn error, but also I don't have any internet. It's like good, I know Trevor is like normal either. You don't have internet? No, I mean, like, I, I installed like the, my Wi Fi uh, driver on the car. Okay. Uh, you have the, the keys configured though? Um, well, I put it inside, but I haven't put it in. Okay. The storage of So are you good then? Or do you need to help out the screen now? Okay. So we can sure sure. Okay, so then, um, so Sam's private key is there now. Let's go ahead and pull it down, make sure this works for him. Pump and apply. I'm just going to get that public key. So we're missing something too. Uh, you, no, where's my fault? Okay, so why? Ah, sorry, I forgot there's one more thing. So what we need to do is hit edit, manifest. All you want to do is you need to do a client. And at the top here, you see the users. You got to add your user to this array. So. And then that that'll uh, only do that once you change your key or add your key to this. Because it's what purchase the other ones will fail. So and then Ian, whenever you're ready for that, let me know and we can add you here. Then so does it get that support us using uh post commit hooks to make sure that like the thing that be posted and run? Yeah, I think there's hooks. Um I'm not sure about specifics, but you take a look. Um let me go to the project. For project, log settings, web hooks. I guess that's what it would be. I've never used any of this. Do you know how this works? I, I mean, I've only used pre commit hooks because GitHub doesn't let you use uh, hooks on the server side. But basically, you write a bash script, and if that bash script returns a failing uh, code, it would reject. Uh, status, it would reject the push. So I drop it in the dot get hooks directory? Yeah. Yeah, I've done that. Okay. I don't know how to do this, so I don't know how these web hooks work. Do you know how these work? Uh, I do not. Okay, I'm just curious. I'd be interested in knowing how to integrate this with something else. Okay, yeah, maybe like IRC or something. You know what I mean? Just to get little messages. Like, it looks like it's supposed to be done with like a Travis UI install, though. Is there an open source version of that? Trigger CI? I don't know, I don't know what that is, but we can take a look. So this is a part of the Travis CI? That's like it's part of part of Jenkins. Jenkins, okay. No, we don't have that, but do you know how to run Jenkins? I've never done it before. But I mean, it's the VM that I could set up. Yeah, if you want, if you'd be interested in that project, I would like to have you work on it. Got it. So I'll go ahead and put you down for that, actually. And if you decide that you don't want to do it anymore, let me know and we'll pass on some of else. So let's go ahead and get you up here. And where are you? Guys that are wanting to work on a project, please do add it to the to do's. Put your name on what you're going to work on. Uh, so we're going to add uh, Sage Client PD and Sam to user. And we're actually doing pretty good. We have a, quite a few Linux hosts up already. Um, let's do repos, log, to do. And we've got servers and software. 
put the servers on, and then we'll do we'll add Jenkins at the very bottom. Um, Uh, Jenkins, and I'll put Sam here. And the Wayland's going to do FTP, so put Wayland here. Um, cute. And we also want to look at anything else, just go ahead and finish up. So I feel like. Pounds, it should be somewhere to say they're done. So pound is finished. So pound, pound. This point will be out in the same though. And then we kind of run it's not quite done. Uh, Alright, working. Let's do it then. It's in progress. This is done. And make all of these out. This is done. In progress. Do you have the virtual box thing working? No, it's, it's the same that the block module is available, but it's not like the Load it? Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. I've never had to use real Linux. Okay, I'll take that back. I've never had that error on Linux. Can you, can you Google that? Yeah, I will. Okay. Let me know if you find out what, why it does or why it's not working. Um, well, I know what I'm doing for tonight. I am going to put up a new bigger box, a bigger box for us, so we don't actually have to dig around with our laptops if it's too complicated, if it causes problems. Um, okay. Uh, I'm still getting the message that it's not trying to access that. Oh, okay. Uh, I have to pull that last, I didn't apply that last change. Is this key in there? No. Okay, Sam, your key is there now. And um, does anybody need uh, access to our action, our GitHub repositories? Do you need those? GitHub? No, I think I got those. Okay, let's check it. Okay, so at this point, um, uh, 
Work on the last few things. Okay, so um, did you see permission to invite him? Happy about what she's happy about. What is the uh, uh, what is a hammy? Uh, what is it? Uh, let's see why is that why hammy was going to be at the HD. A hammy is the host name. Okay, okay, so let's uh, actually. And all right, so there's the last few lines. Invalid user SAM pre op. So initializing SAM settings for SAM. Hold in your your host information variable. Um, what's this in it? User stupid. Oh. You missed the letter in the book. Here's the problem. So, um, bear with me. I have a lot of good things. I forget. <laughs> so, is all users a group that the user has to be part of to get to the device user or something? Yeah. So, well, what we're doing is, uh, you're, you asked them to do a group instead. What? Are you, are you, sorry. I heard half of what you said. Uh, that's, that's asking is all users of type of special group that you have on uh, that, that it won't let you SSH in and that's a part of that group or something. It's not by group, but it is by user. But since you brought that up, it's smarter to actually do it by user. So I don't have to edit this. Sorry. I actually, I was created a user for a while, so I actually forgot um, how we had it set up. So let's fix that right now. So modules. SSH, and then we're going to do man, or we're going to do um, templates, SSH config, and then the bottom you can see here, um, you need to add Sam, Ian, and I'll, I'll rewrite this to some rules better later, and then I'll log to, so you all can log in. Uh, 
Um, it looks like we need to create a blood member for and then just do the to allow uh for, uh groups and then put blood to the end. That's the best solution for that. Uh, groups, yes. Okay. So at this point, that's just a simple edit and that should be that. What space you want for an FTP server? I don't know. No, probably no more twenty. All right, Sam. Sorry about that. Let's go ahead and apply this now. Okay. Cool. Well, it's a good thing that we're going through all the way through the motions too, because then everybody that's here can also see how it's all done. Get this file, this file, this file. It looks like I need to go ahead and start creating groups. All right. So you can also see here. So with the SSH configuration done, you copy the new file over, there's a new hash, and then you know it's using the service um, type to automatically restart SSH once there's a new file in place. So it's going to refresh with that. That's kind of nice. Really, <laughs> Sam, I would expect this to work for you now if you would give it a shot. Gotcha. Don't you deny Okay. Oh, this is actually okay. I should probably should introduce that, Jay. Uh, all right. So we're gonna do this. I think it's because this. I didn't think that through. Try that. All right. So now service. So wait, you asked. It, it's it like it requires. I don't know. Is it just whitelist based on one? No, what I think log doesn't exist as a group, but it's just causing a problem. So try again. Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay, so I need to go ahead and create a group for log. And that's not going to be hard. So, um, unless my fault for anything. So, um, should I define bridge as Zen Bro? Huh? You don't need to edit any of that. Uh, that's all the random chose for you. But yeah, it, sh it should be that interface. All you really need, though, um, is uh, size, memory, and CPU. And for CPU, don't use any word to and host name. Hey, host name. Yeah. Well, I'm actually set the net masking gateway. Yes. And PyGrub? The yeah. file system? Yes. Yeah. It's in the same column file. We talked about that one last week. It, does a, it applies the rules to. I don't want to do this. Let's go back. Modules that's are common. Let's go to manifests. Copy users to groups.pp. And this is just going to be a group module for now. Groups. And this should, could be a lot simpler. And now, of course, we do begin with fumbly do public types, get the type reference out, figure out what, what groups uh, should be sent to. Uh, groups right here. 
We can ensure that the group exists, so that property needs to be set to present. So uh, we're going to group, and we're going to say group's going to be called uh, LUD. Right, and we're going to do this. We're going to say uh, present or ensure, set that, ensure. And it'll actually get the name from the property value if the name is not set. So the resource title is actually the appropriate term for it. And then that can anything we have any questions from the try to start it. Was it turn install? Um all the packages on the show. I could try and try to give a bunch of uh yes and Um, okay, so can we go ahead and make an SSH machine? I'm just going to I want to check the game sort of with us. Yep, sure. What did I talk about last night? Still with the package, the cash packages, 44 minutes. So it's going to be doing this for a while. <laughs> yeah, we have to start that shit at night. I'm just going to go home. Man. Did you do it, in your, do it in Vegas yet? Uh, Workflow man, do it in Vegas so we can verify it, and then we we'll put it on the server. I'm just carving out the VM right now. Yeah, you got, but you shouldn't have to do it. You just call it directly. Like, I always put everything in Vegas. It's just a good workflow first, and when you know it works, then you carve out the VM. Okay. I mean... I'm just saying. Well, I'm not going to install anything before I do it in Vagrant. You know what I mean? Right. It's going to do it locally and then do it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the VM just sits up there. I mean, it's, I mean, it's not a problem, I suppose, but just make this. I'm just afraid you're going to forget to do the 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 Vagrant VM, which is the important thing. Okay. Um, you already logged in now. Um, so do this. Um, Take a look at apps, sources, nope, apps, uh, cons.e, and see if there's a zero one proxy file. Which one? In, in the bigger VMC, this file exists. Oops. Yeah, I Okay, that's small. I'll remove that file. And then just uh, exile the VM and do bigger provision. Very good. Well, no, this in churn. Okay. Uh, um, so now I need to figure out how to apply everybody into this group. So should we type up like uh, is there any way we can self service some of these? I mean, like. In a, in a perfect world, we're going to grow more, and so we're going to have to do this sort of onboarding stuff. Right. And so is there any way we can like make this easier for people? What do you mean? Which part? It's pretty easy right now. Like, you just have to edit three files. Well, it's going to be just two for a new right. user. You know, it's a lot easier than creating 15 new accounts on the machines. Um, can you access, um, see if you can access like wgetgoogle.com or something. Well, I, if you want documentation, uh, that would be great. Um, I would ask for help with that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm not suggesting you do it all yourself. I'm just okay. saying, do you think it would be something that would be worthwhile? Yeah, documentation would be helpful. Or you can already use the video too, which unfortunately last week didn't record it, but there you go. I mean, because hopefully we grow some more. 
Like if you're going to have some uh, configuration tool copy over a dot file. Sorry guys. Uh, right. Right. Uh, for right. the right. 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 Yeah. Right. Would that also be a file? I said if we wanted like a piece of code that copy over a uh, B sharp C uh, or bash sharp C config for each user, would that be in this file? Yeah, you can put it here. Yeah. Um, that's the way you set the default shell to be if C should installed on the system. Yeah. Um, so if you go to the very top shell, mm -hmm. just copy and paste that line to our default and put to this. But if you want to change it, say, for uh, me, I would just uh, add it here and then do uh, bin z. Okay, and is it smart enough to then only execute that line if z should actually be there or if it has results? Uh, no, I don't think so. You'll have to make sure it's installed. So okay. you'll have to create a new module. Um, actually, what well, you don't even have to do that. What you can do is just go to the, you already have a packages module. Okay, mm -hmm. so. Um, So uh, in the in the common module, there's this packages one already here. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is add the shell, so it's already there. So okay. it's already on all the systems. Um, but if you want to require it, uh, which it's probably the best to do it from where we have it in the config, but there's a require option. So if you would say, uh, copy over your each config file prior to or uh, verify before you copy over the each config file, check if the pack the package is each is installed. In that case, you just do um, whenever you do your file copy thing, then you just do uh, require, and then you would say um, package, and you would do uh, z here. So that that way, um, it only install only execute what's ever above if z should install. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'm almost done with um, creating new blood groups. So let's see here. Checking this works. So they create provision. Oops, I can just do this. Let's see if that works. Ian, do you need help? Okay, when I tried doing bigger now on the SSH cube, I added 15 versus like four days to make five. Okay, can you go in the VM and verify that uh, you can access the internet or something like wgetu.com? Inside the VM. Huh? Inside the VM. Inside the VM? Yeah. Well, it works? Yeah. Okay, right, then get rid of, um, boy, is that package file there again? I think that's it. Get the one. Check if that pack, the app gets file, or the app call file is there. I bet that's what's happening, and I think I just forgot to actually come out out a client line in the video config. Okay. It's not there anymore. Okay. Now, um, well, honestly, I need to do that. Every time you run that, it's going to copy that file over. So that's me. Here, what you can do for now, you can do, um, well, I'll just upload the East Manifest side of PP. This is actually where you clean all the modules for each host. That host is called test right here. So we just need to comment out that line. Or this. this is in uh, Manifest uh, site on PP. So what the repo and then manifest side of PP. I'll go ahead and upload that. Um, and that's because I believe it's limited from to our IP space and on the VMs. That's where we're getting those foreign grids. Right? Actually, that's exactly why I'm getting those foreign grids. Um, you know what? It's almost better just to have that. I'm going to go ahead and just allow everything for now. 
It would be nice to be able to write our bigger number comes big without having to change much. So to do that, I need to edit repo uh, file at cacher.com. And then I need to give it a loud host variable and change that to star. And that should do it. There you just um, pause right here. One second. Yeah, I can keep that there. So what is the diff? Uh, Is that in real is it? Yeah, I guess I did some of which. Um, oh well. What were you saying? Um, what I'm going to change. Uh, you don't, just do get pulled in just a second. You don't have to change anything. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and prove that again. That should work. All right. So now what we're going to do is get add manifest.pp and then we want to do uh, module repo file that cache. Okay. So that should allow us. Um, repo allow access outside of the internet. So can GitLab be set up to uh, use uh, So we can pull that. Can you set up to use like open LDAP as a uh, back end for yeah. user accounts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so hopefully we'll have that whenever we have an LDAP server. Alright. And we'll hopefully have a Kerberos server too. Definitely, it works. It's kind of funny because right now we're still making a bunch of scripts so that whenever we add a new user, they get you know propagated to all the different boxes. But under the, what we're going towards, you just have a Kerberos and an open and then you do hands Kerberos authentication for everything. Right. Which kind of slightly uh, ironic. So you planning on like? Uh, I've never done an open LDAP installation myself. Yeah, I've, done anything. I've, I've managed them for business before, but right. so I don't have to off my head. So I don't actually plan on getting into that for a long time. Alright. So unless you know how to do it. I don't. I know ACM admin used to run their own uh, stack, which was just about what we're going towards. Mm -hmm. uh, they, although the top of a lot, they used uh, AFS as their file system. There's there's a reason that they've walked away from it. Sure. Not the world's easiest. Right. Uh, but uh, and I do think it's a pretty cool idea. I'm just curious about whether or not we're gonna, gonna keep all this internal or whether we're gonna like open it up to other things too. Seems to kinda of today they have a Travis system that only our internal projects can hit. Um well uh, it was originally going to well, we planned it just to be for open NSM and log. I'm fine with opening it up. However, with that comes more responsibility for me because then it's like I have other people's projects. I mean, if I have help, that'd be great. But you know, if something goes down and other people's pro groups rely on it, you know, what I mean, there's more of an incentive for me to put more time. And I'm busy with work already. And, and so you, you don't really need to do it because you'll be here for a while, so you don't need to source like other people to try to pick it up. Right. Um, I would like to be able to get teach everybody out. Like, get, well, I should, I'm, I'm kind of doing now teaching them, but people have yeah. to get enough experience with their by themselves. Um, but I also don't feel comfortable at this point with just our Zen project system. We would need a cluster. I would want because um, we have a single this VM host on a single machine right now. So if we could do like a Gnetic cluster, that'd be great. Um, but I don't have any more servers for that right now. Open in the sense we have three servers, hopefully five. Okay. Four uh, four door did any cluster and a development Zen project system. The Zen project system is racked now in ACM. That got done two or three weeks ago. Uh, now I just need to get the funding for uh we're for some sponsors um, for um, the Kennedy cluster. And that way, if you know one of the nodes goes down, we still have three others that the VMs are all distributed upon. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. I know that like the Sphere sensor has a way of migrating things back and forth, but I don't think Zen does. Yeah, Zen does. Uh, but if you um, if you use Gennady, 
it's Google's management software around Zen and KVM. They have a thing built in called uh, DRVD. It's uh, disk overlay. So you create your VM as a DRVD image through the command line console. It actually replicates that to all the nodes. Okay. So every node has the same copy. So every time you work on a node, you can see the traffic going to all the other nodes, copying all that same that data over. So that, that, that's how we actually do fa uh, failover in uh, Kinetic. All right. That, that makes sense. The APM system would be that they had all the uh, like non-important, all the VMs would be hosted on AFS, which would be a separate hardware systems. So that meant for a very big headache when the HFD systems got turned on in time for these other systems to resolve DHCP to these systems so they can have the network drive so that they can boot everything else. And it, was, it was a huge pain mm -hmm. in the day. So it, I, I think Google's approach makes a lot more sense, especially at scale. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm excited to see what that looks like. Cool. Yeah, hopefully I'll be able to do talk on that in the future and just kind of get more. I got it working in my house. I got two two Dell uh, two Dell CF twenty fours in my apartment, I should say. Right. They have it working on, but once we get a rack, we can demo it. Seems cool. All right, man. See you later. Thanks for coming. All right, um, Ian. Sorry, did you? Yeah. Let's see what it looks like here. Just busy much with you. All right, David. Um, can you get bolt? Um. We're doing a baby announcement that gave it that's before passive this time. I have no idea why. I did do you fall. Those are the most recent ones. Okay. Um, I don't know. Um, Well, the good thing is, is that key still there? Uh, I, I put mine inside the um, inside the uh, of the key. Oh, this is the the key to log into Vagrant. Um, you see what I'm saying? So it's looking for this key file. That that might be why. Does that exist? I don't know how to copy. No, I, I don't. Did I copy the? My, my power key there? Yeah, this would be the bigger key. So they have kind of their own default key. I imagine you didn't change it, but let's just check. Um, home, print, build, puppet, machines, default. Oh, it's almost there. Uh, is that the. Uh, you didn't change this, no, right? No. I wonder why. Okay, anyway, so it looks like you can see it's on two two where you can log in because um I don't know how to do this. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Uh SSH oh, we can just do vagrant uh SSH. The password by default is vagrant. Just so you know. And you can log in with the password for now. And then I would just rebuild the VM. Um so what about when um wait. Yep. That is the default password, so strange. Um any authentication is broke on this thing. Uh, uh, dash P2222, and then we do um, vagrant at 127.001. Uh, let's get that option. Dash users, no posts. Okay, so yeah, this is, if this doesn't work, then you need to rebuild that again. Okay, so just um, here you destroy. destroyed. And I expect if you rebuilt it, it should work. I don't know if it was something to do with the puppet config. It should be that where mine's working. It's not causing any issues with mine. Um, it was just too big. Oh, wait. Maybe it is. 
I didn't, that's, I had extra money. Huh? Yeah. Um, you want to do it to the big right now? Yeah, I do bigger. Let me hold it back up. All right, well, that concludes a lot. We'll come down. April. See you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. See you later next week. Next week we're out next week. Have a good night. Oh man, I'm tired.